Uh, we want to welcome in now our next guest, Fred McClymans, partner and head of research at Samadhi Partners and contributor at Seeking Alpha. Fred, it's good to see you on Tuesday. We know Apple admitted to neglecting the Mac Pro and issued a rare apology for this company. What is your reaction to this? You know, this is really a, a surprising turn of events. Uh, if you consider Apple and their inability historically to actually accept responsibility for their missteps. I mean, but we think back to uh, Apple Maps uh, when it was released. Uh, extracting a, an apology out of Apple at that point was, uh, was almost impossible. Uh, and uh, for this to happen though with the, the Mac Pro, this is actually a big thing. The Mac Pro uh, was at one point uh, Apple's flagship big desktop device. Uh, it, uh, it had tremendous appeal, it had a unique design, uh, it uh, suffered a little bit from some heat issues that uh, resulted in some of that design fabric there, but uh, you know they haven't done anything with this product since 2013. Literally, it has been sitting on the shelf while everybody else has been worrying about uh, you know uh, ear pods and uh, the latest uh, you know OLED screen for the iPhone 8. So uh, it's interesting to see them come to this point here. Now I'm really curious, what are they going to do with it? Right, some people wondering too, why even invest here? I mean, look, it's been four years, that, that is a long time for, for any update, but it comes at a time when Microsoft is moving harder into the space, trying to appeal to creators, as they called it, with the Microsoft Surface Pro. Do you feel like the investment they're making now is simply in response to Microsoft's decision? I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Uh, you know, if you look at this, uh, it has not been a priority, uh, you know, clearly within Apple. Uh, but uh, right now, I think they've, they've realized, or starting to realize at least, that they are losing the creative uh, battle here. Uh, they're uh, seeing it in new devices from Microsoft, and, and certainly there's an important aspect to consider. It's not so much the device these days uh, as it is the software. And the value that Apple really bought to the, uh, the creative space that software is, is more readily replicated by others, including Microsoft. So when you uh, put a little bit of hardware effort uh, behind this effort and a little bit of software design, it's very easy for Apple to kind of lose their base. And that I think kind of comes back to what Apple might be trying to do here. They're trying to make sure they don't lose that core base uh, of Apple supporters because uh, you know, I can tell you as a, a Mac fan for years, I love the technology on the hardware side and the software, but what I really like is the way they blend hardware and software. But they've got to do a better job here uh, moving forward. So just uh, double clicking on that for a second, I've always found um, Apple lagging on the software side and uh, what they did do was make software really simple for a broad base of users, but um, I, I've always seen them to be a better hardware company than they are a software company, and almost uh, just because of the seamlessness, people end up using Apple products. How competitive do you think they're going to be able to be on the more hardcore creative suite at this point, just given how far behind they've seemed to fall in to folks like now Microsoft, but also Adobe and others that have been uh, going after the creative class for a long time. Well, I think you've got a, a really valid point there. I think it's going to be increasingly difficult for them to maintain this, uh, this edge in the creative space. Uh, you know, when you talk about uh, the software not quite being there, um, you know, yes, the hardware that Apple has designed over the years has been phenomenal, but it's the way they use the hardware, um, a bit software and a bit uh, of, uh, you know, strategy. Uh, you know, look at the value that the uh, App Store and, uh, uh, and uh, iTunes brought to the iPhone, and that really made the iPhone. The iPhone was great, but once you put the App Store in there, that really jettisoned it forward uh, as a true disruptive innovation in the marketplace. I don't think they have that ability to do that any longer. You know, what we're seeing out of Apple is they're executing and they're monetizing, but they're no longer delivering that, that breakthrough innovation. At best, they're doing incremental innovation at this point. So how much do you think the Mac Pro story then is about delivering uh, more powerful computing devices, especially as they lose some of those more hardcore gamers, as you know, when we move into VR and Oculus, et cetera, it's notable that most of those devices only really work with the high-powered uh, PCs as opposed to the Apple machines. How much do you think this is more a function of getting the hardcore gaming market than it is a real push for soft on software for the creative class? I'm not sure that they can get that, uh, that hardcore gaming market uh, you know, under the Apple uh, umbrella at this point. Uh, you know, there are so many other technology solutions out there and so many other uh, you know, hardware uh, vendors that they're, just, they're totally kicking it uh, you know, when it comes to hardware performance. 
So I really don't see that as, as Apple's play here. And I don't really think that's their forte. Uh, you know, Apple in the gaming space, uh, you know, years ago in the, uh, in the 80s, I'll be the first to admit uh, I was addicted to Apple's Maze Wars uh, on the uh, original Mac SE. But, uh, but these days, uh, I just don't associate uh, the Mac Book or the Mac Pro in this case with, uh, with gaming technology. So it sounds like you're bearish then. Or, or do you think uh, analysts should be relooking at their estimates for the MacBook Pro? Do you think uh, maybe there's too much baked into Apple stock right now? Are you taking the contra point to Mr. Buffett and some others who have just gone long? Well, you know, Apple is certainly uh, enjoying a great ride uh, at this point here. Uh, you know, and, and I won't comment one way or the other, but I will say that uh, I think the ride they're enjoying uh, is uh, coming a little bit at the expense of uh, Samsung uh, and uh, a little bit of hype uh, over the iPhone 8 moving forward here. Um, you know, I'd recommend people take a closer look at, uh, at Apple and where they can really deliver. Uh, and to be honest, I don't see the Mac Pro moving the needle, uh, you know, at this point all that much, maybe just to help out those existing customers already. Fred, let's turn our attention to Yelp, recently making a $20 million purchase of Turn Style Analytics. Now, this is a company that is trying to help link businesses with some of their customers. How do you think that this is going to affect Yelp's business? You know, with, uh, with Yelp, I mean, here you've got a company, uh, they're about 700, a little over 700 million in, uh, in annual revenue. Uh, their market cap, I believe, is around 2.6 billion, uh, but they haven't really hit that profitability stride yet and they need to find ways to uh, expand their offering a bit for their, uh, for their business customers. Now, Yelp has done really well uh, in capturing people uh, in establishments after they've been there and posting a review about it. They're getting a little bit better at driving people to establishments, but it's that in-establishment activity where they're really missing uh, you know, a key piece here. Uh, now, Turnstile, this is a small deal. This is a $20 million deal. Uh, you know, for uh, a $2.6 billion company. So uh, I don't expect huge things out of it, but it does indicate that Yelp is really trying to go after more of that in-store uh, engagement and uh, perhaps some of the loyalty uh, dollars that can come with that. Okay, also too, when it comes to Yelp, I mean, do you think that this is enough, even though it is a tiny acquisition, enough to keep people using Yelp? I mean, one of the biggest complaints, obviously, is that there's just so much information, it's sort of hard to weed through everything. Yeah, this acquisition, I don't think, will do anything to keep Yelp users in, in place. This is really more about uh, new user or new customer acquisition. Uh, so, you know, with, uh, with Turnstile and, and their, uh, their Wi-Fi analytics package, what you're really doing is uh, you're getting more information about people that are in a particular location, uh, their email address, and what they're doing uh, you know, on the web, what they're searching for, what they're engaging with. Uh, it also offers the ability to offer some type of uh, sort of you know, VIP uh, access. So uh, if you think about you know, being in a facility, uh, you know, cellular is certainly ubiquitous, and uh, when 5G rolls around, uh, there are even people who are questioning you know, what will the future of Wi-Fi really be. Uh, but if you can get people to go to that in-store Wi-Fi to get additional information, an additional experience that they can't get outside of the store, uh, that could bring in uh, you know new customer uh, base uh, to uh, Yelp. And that's really what they need at this point. They, they need more users. Isn't this about monetization, though, more than it is about user acquisition? It seems, you know, uh, quite a stretch to think that we're going to pull people into coffee shops and then get them onto Yelp. Aren't they just looking for more data and more importantly, more ad inventory in those coffee shops to be able to serve up relevant advertising? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I won't discount the value of new users uh, coming into the system. Uh, and uh, you know, I've got to expect that there will be a pretty significant overlap between users using uh, the Turnstile uh, system and existing Yelp users there. But uh, you know, analytics really is key, and that will drive a lot. But you know, with analytics, you can only mine your existing customer base so deep before you do need to expand and offer additional services that, that bring new data and potentially new customers into the mix. So you know, while I don't think this is a, a significant move for Yelp, uh, I do think it is a good move. Yelp went from more than $90 back in 2014 to now, three years later, at about 33 bucks a share or so. And so many people skeptical as to whether or not, at least from a stock perspective, that this company can really turn it around. I mean, Fred, do you see, do you see a bullish scenario where Yelp could rebound and get back to at least maybe near those record highs or pair some of these recent losses? 
At this point uh, in the market, uh, I don't see anything that's really going to move uh, Yelp's needle uh, in, in any significant way. Uh, if you look at the competitors that are out there uh, in the marketplace, uh, you know, it's not just one or two, there are a number of competitors out there. And the value that they're bringing to the table is software. And that software is very easily uh, replicated by others uh, at this point. So, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not overly bullish on Yelp at all. What about M&A? Anything out there or have they, uh, has that ship sailed all, as well? You know, I haven't heard of anything recently. Uh, no rumors floating across uh, the transom here, but uh, uh, you know, I would hold that out as a possibility, you know, much in the same way that uh, I would look at Twitter. And oh, Fred McClyman. I think we lost the feed there. Anyway, Fred McClyman's partner and head of research at Samadhi Partners and contributor at Seeking Alpha, a partner of ours now. We're happy you joined us.